Now I would like to welcome our first speaker, Saskia Madliner, who produces science documentaries for Oregon State Media Productions. She will share how she has combined her passions for science and film as she has followed researchers to Greenland and spent years traveling the world to produce videos for scientists and research institutions. So Saskia, you may now go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. Hello. Um, so is this working? Yes. Okay, and do I have to turn on my video as well? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Oh, I see where it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, um, Oregon Sea Grant and Hatfield for putting this together and for inviting me to participate. So, um, and thanks for that kind introduction, Lindsay. So I've been doing this for maybe seven, eight years now, um, both independently as a film and video producer. And for the past almost two years, I've been back at OSU uh, working as a, as a producer for Oregon State Productions. And so we are a unit within URM, University Relations and Marketing. Um, actually, I think we have, um, and we, um, we get hired by uh, departments or individual scientists or um, affiliate um, institutions or, um, uh, you know, like the research station in Port Orford, for example, or Hatfield um, to produce videos for them. So I'll give you a little background about me. So I have a, a BS in environmental science from Bucknell. So I'm from the East Coast originally. I'm from New York. And, um, and then I came here in 2012 to Oregon for the first time to get my degree in marine resource management. And I came getting this degree not knowing at all what I wanted to do, um, except that I knew, I've always known I wanted to be a filmmaker. And that was sort of uh, an unclear idea for a long time what that meant for, for a career. But I was also really attracted to marine science. And throughout my career as an undergrad, I focus on marine science. And then I also knew that I, I was pretty um, active um, on social and environmental issues in undergrad. And I really wanted uh, a career that would help me make a difference in the world, help contribute to social change. Um, and so I had, so at OSU, I had a wonderful, um, uh, our program manager, Flaxen Conway, um, was very supportive of me when I went to her and I said, all I want to do is make a documentary <laughs> uh, for my degree. How can I make that work um, and how can I fit that into my thesis? And then um, she was open to, for me to do that as long as there was a really good research component tied to that, which uh, we made work as well. Um, and then I got invited to go out on a cruise in Greenland which is a very difficult place to get to, pretty remote. Well, it was back then, it is a little less difficult um, now, although pre-COVID now. Um, and to join um, two OSU researchers on the ship that you see on the bottom, my left, bottom left, bottom your left, um, called the SANA, which is a, a Greenland-based um, research vessel to study two fjord systems where glaciers are behaving very differently. And they brought me on to produce a short documentary. Um, and so I did that. Um, and so you'll see a little thumbnail here called Greenland's Glaciers. And I ended up producing a 20 minute um, documentary and presenting it as part of my um, master's degree and also doing conducting social science research through this, this film, basically. Um, and then I discovered just how much I love talking to scientists and and trying to translate in an artistic way, this research, which was actually quite complex, looking at um, ocean forcing, how the ocean is impacting these glaciers, the behavior of the glaciers, um, and trying to communicate that to a broader public. So upon graduating, I moved back to New York and I established a, a, a brand and a company called 77th Parallel Productions. And that's an homage to this first film because that's the, the highest latitude we reached was 77 degrees north. And, um, and my slogan is humanize your science because my uh, approach was to show that scientists are not just um, people in white lab coats 
who speak jargon at you. They are people who really care about the work that they're doing. And especially, especially in people, well, I'm not going to say this, but, you know, um, I've noticed in earth science that uh, there is sort of an environmental twist to what they're doing. And so I focus mostly on marine science. And uh, for a few years, I kept getting hired. So um, you'll see some thumbnails here of some projects that I worked on. Um, bottom left, I got hired right away by somebody um, at Hatfield, actually, um, to produce a series on research being done in, um, along the Marianas Trench um, and looking at seamounts along the ridge, actually. So that was really cool. We, we left from Guam. And then I did some projects for other organizations, like the North Pacific Marine Science Organization. Then I went back to Greenland a few times, once for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, and then I moved to the Netherlands. I'm originally from Belgium, so I moved back to Europe and um, and I worked closely with um, Science Media, which is a Dutch company, and I got a lot better at video production. So for a long time, I've sort of been doing these documentary style videos. Um, and then at Science Media, I learned a slightly more commercial approach. And on the bottom right, you see In Search of Earth Secrets, and that's a project we did for the NSF, which is um, a traveling um, science exhibit. Um, and one part of it is there's this big blow up ship uh, that you can go inside and there are three screens and it's surround sound and you're going back in time uh, through geological history, looking at marine sediments, ocean sediments. Um, and it talks about how we use sediments to, uh, to trace um, Earth's climate in the past. So that was, those are really fun projects. But then almost two years ago, um, I got offered a job here back at Oregon State. And, um, and I really liked the prospect of working more closely with researchers who are working on projects that I can really get behind. Because again, remember, I want to make things, I wanted to focus on projects that could make a difference in one way or another. And so, um, like I said before, we produce videos and films for different researchers, colleges and programs um, within and outside the university. There needs to be a university connection for us to produce something though. And we are currently working on a documentary called The Second Warning. So this is a feature length documentary, meaning that it's over an hour, um, following Dr. Bill Ripple, who's an ecologist who um, discovered that reintroducing the wolves to Yellowstone um, was actually really good for the ecology. And he established, or he furthered this idea of trophic cascades, that you need apex predators in a system for the ecosystem to be healthy and thriving. Um, and so we're following his trajectory from science to advocacy. He's decided to produce, uh, to publish a few um, articles now that are a call to action. And um, his first paper was, um, was called uh, A Scientist Warning a Second Notice to humanity, a warning to humanity. And it lays out all the ways that we need to change course because we are currently uh, destroying the environment. Um, but it's, it's a very, there's a nice positive spin to the paper. And he had over 21,000 science signatories from around the world. So we've been following him since he published this paper. Um, and we are now in the editing phase and it's kicking my butt. <laughs> it's a lot of footage, two years worth of footage. So. Um, and so back to my original goal in filmmaking, it really was to, um, to have some kind of impact. I, I really believed that film could change people's minds, right? Very rarely, but it does happen. And so I wanted to bring up a couple of instances um, in documentary where um, it helped people become maybe more science literate on specific issues, or um, it sort of drove some policy or drove some politics. So I don't know if you guys remember, but An Inconvenient Truth came out in 01 or 02. So after um, Al Gore lost the race to Bush, um, this came out and it's a little bit, oh no, maybe it was before the election actually, but he's like kind of on his campaign trail and um, he's giving this presentation about the hockey stick um, effect, which is a Michael Mann graph, a scientist out of Penn State where he correlates temperature and CO2. And then there's this big line that goes up um, after 1880 about, so a little after the industrial revolution. Um, and it sort of put this idea on the map for a lot of people and it got people, even though climate change was an issue already in the seventies, eighties, it got people to really talk about climate um, with uh, a little bit more literacy. 
And then the Blackfish Effect, this is a really great documentary if you haven't seen it. It was, it came out in 12, 2012, I think. Um, and this is about how SeaWorld uh, would, uh, how would you say this? Like what would poach <laughs> um, orcas from the wild or breed them and then how they treated them um, in their facilities. And one, um, one whale in particular, Tilikum, uh, lashed out against some of the trainers. And so the film is a little bit about that. And then um, right after it premiered, SeaWorld stocks declined by 60%. Um, and now currently SeaWorld, SeaWorld no longer um, uh, goes out, breeds or, or um, takes orcas out of the wild. So that is a film that had a big impact. Um, and then another thing, so to switch back to Oregon State Productions, uh, I see I have a few minutes here, and I wanted to screen two videos for you guys. So um, I work very closely with what is called the Marine Studies Initiative on campus, which is a wonderful program for undergraduates, where you can um, basically do what I did in grad school, um, but as an undergrad, and you can do it across all disciplines. So they, um, their goal is for you to come out with a Marine Studies degree where you can marry, you know, uh, coastal policy with physical oceanography or marine biology with filmmaking or literature. Um, it's really about this crossover between the humanities and the natural sciences or the social sciences. And so um, part of my contract here is to produce um, videos for them annually. And we've done a series called Ocean Stewards of Today and Tomorrow. So I'm going to show you one of those now. And after that, um, featuring a student and after that i'll show you one of our latest projects that is not published yet on nanoplastics and then uh, we can go to a q a so let me go let me get out of this and i'll show you this video first oh, okay oh no this is the full screen i believe yeah here we go okay so hopefully you guys can see this. Um, I can see it, Saskia. Okay, thanks. Great. I grew up going to the beach a lot with my dad. We would take road trips along like the coast, everywhere from like Washington coast all the way down to like Big Sur in California. So I spent a lot of time with my dad on the coast as like a younger kid. I'm a first generation college student. While my parents didn't get the same opportunities that I did, they're super supportive and they've worked really hard to get me to this point. What first made me realize marine biology is a path in life that you can actually take was when I was like 12, watching the movie Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. It's modeled after Jacques Cousteau, and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, and I had never realized that was a thing that people have actually done before. And then my interest didn't reignite until I actually showed up at OSU. I first got involved in MSI through the Marine Studies Club, full of great people who are now some of my closest friends, my support system. MSI seeks to get all of these disciplines together and try to solve these ocean to human related issues. And I've never seen another initiative do that. We live in an age of climate change, hypoxia, ocean acidification, an ocean that so many rely on it for food, it has aesthetic value, it has all these things. And we live in a time where that is more at risk than ever. It was like seeing a new color a little bit for the first time. I can't unsee the ocean from that humanistic, all-encompassing perspective. And I'm so grateful that I'm involved with an initiative that I believe truly does make a difference. So that's that one. Can't even escape. Um, huh. There we go. And I was going to show you another one. Am I good? To, it, oh, it's choppy. Um, okay. So we could, uh, so this one's under two minutes. 
Um, and this one's much more experimental in style. Uh, so it's not published yet, but it's going to be published very soon. Okay, so here we go. Plastics come in all shapes and sizes, all kinds, but it may be the smallest particles, invisible to the naked eye, that threaten humans and animals the most. These are the plastics that end up at the end of the waste stream, from our streets and landfills to waterways, bays, and eventually the ocean. We know them as microplastics, microscopic pieces of synthetic polymers that end up in the guts of fish, whales, seabirds, even oysters. But what if we went even smaller, so small that, like a toxin, they could end up in our very cells? So small, you would need 100,000 of them to equal the thickness of a sheet of paper, with millions of tons of plastic ending up as marine litter every year. Some researchers posit that compared to all the macro and microplastics, there are just as many, if not more, nanoplastics. Researchers at OSU are developing tools and methods to detect these sneaky hazards. Not only their presence in the water, but also their type. The biggest culprits so far? Rubber tires and synthetic clothing. Particles and fibers that can easily break down to this toxic size as they make their way down to the ocean. So what can you do? Here are some things to consider. Okay, so that's that. Um, yeah, and I thought I would just open it up to questions. Um, those are very different styles for videos, um, and there's tons of styles, obviously. So, um, but if anybody, yeah, anyway, I have my email up here. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Saskia. It's always fun to hear from you and hear your perspective and also see some of the media that you've produced. So uh, go ahead and submit questions to the Q&A box as you have questions and we will go ahead and ask questions of Saskia here for the next few minutes. Um, I will say a quick question I have for you is you said that was two different styles and there are many styles. So how do you go about choosing the best style for your job? So how, if you can expand on that a little bit more. Sure. So uh, this is something we talk about a lot in my field and in my view, it's really a confluence. So one of the first things you ask yourself when you're going to produce um, media for a, on a specific topic or for a researcher is who's your target audience, right? Who are you um, trying to educate or, or raise awareness to? Um, and the other side of that is how artistic or risky do you want to be? <laughs> so, um, so so the the first video is a, what we call a, a student profile or just a profile of a person and because of covid we found a way to um to produce a very dynamic video that uses lots of our stock footage that we have on hand um but that uh leverages stills that we got from the subject and they actually they just self-documented on their cell phone so we did a series of six using that method um so that was kind of like a like a nice style to discover and to um, perfect as a result of COVID. And, um, and then the second video is, it's all hyperlapsed. So those are all, they're sort of sped up shots. They're stills actually. And um, we wanted to do something, I wanted to make a spunky video because I wanted someone, I wanted people, the gen, like a broader public to walk away with three nuggets of information. The main one being, there are, there are such things as nanoplastics and they could be toxic to us. They're so small that they enter our cells potentially or the cells of marine organisms. Um, and the other two are, okay, the sources are tires, uh, tire particles, and the other source is synthetic clo clothing and what can I do with that? So it's a bit of a PSA style. Um, and so you, you have to, yeah, think about your audience and then just maybe take a little bit of a risk stylistically as well. Great, thanks Saskia. We have a question about um, from someone from Jeremiah. How many presentations, and I think that you mean um, films or videos, 
when you say presentations, have you done and have you done any on like marine animals? So have you had a marine animal focus in any of your videos, Sasia? No, it's funny when I tell people, uh, you know, my friends or people I meet, what I do, they always assume that I have a marine biology background, which I don't. I have more of a physical oceanography background. Um, I've never done anything on animals because that requires such a um, another skill, which is uh, underwater filming, which I'm actually, I was in the middle of getting training for, but then um, things got interrupted, obviously. But in terms of how many films I've made, um, so like shorter documentaries, probably five. So in like the 15 to 20 minute range and then videos, probably, I don't know, 30, 30 videos. Awesome. And just real quick, if you can expand on, you said you were starting to get training to go towards the animal focus point. So if there are some of our viewers interested in doing film, but maybe working in um, or having their uh, videos focus on animals, how would you go about that? Right. Uh, and yeah, I didn't finish that thought. So um, to to shoot marine, to film marine, um, uh, marine organisms, you ha tend to have to go underwater. Right. And so um, you have to get specific scuba training. It's actually science diving um, and which I don't have yet. Um, and it doesn't mean that. But as a director, it doesn't mean that I have to be the one filming. So we just haven't had a commission yet or a researcher um who who's had a marine bio focus or an organism focus there are obviously people here you know at osu and at hatfield who are uh, whale focused we even have a, an institute around um you know the marine mammal institute and then lee torres does some great work out of port orford so we've done some stuff with her footage but that was all aerial footage of whales um mostly gray whales um but so it really depends on what path you decide to take uh, within film, you know, you have camera people, you have editors, you have producers, directors, sound people. Our team, we tend to cross over a few of those. I'm, I'm usually director, writer, producer. Um, very rarely am I on camera, but I'm really dying to get underwater and to film myself because it's such a cool thing to do. <laughs> awesome, Saskia. And so in thinking about backgrounds, so you said you have a kind of more of an oceanography background. So someone who wants to pursue a career in combining science and film, um, what types of backgrounds or degrees do, would you recommend? Um, maybe have you seen your colleagues? And then like, do, do you need to focus on maybe a degree that would make you able to um, kind of understand what you're, what you're filming, right? So having a science background, how much does a science background matter? And maybe how much background research do you do when you're actually filming on a certain topic? I know that's a lot of, I'm combining questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's great. That's a great question. So um, I don't think, I don't want to ever leave anyone out for, with a different background. I actually, our team, we come from all different backgrounds. We have one fiction writer uh, who, who just really gets science, um, who gets research and he gets the process. He's been doing it long enough. So despite... The, you know, regardless of his of his technical background or schooling, um, he's one of our better science communicators. Actually, I'm the only one on the team with uh, any science related degree, um, and, and it certainly helps for me to be on certain projects that are science heavy, and I can help translate that stuff. Um, but that's why I love the Marine Studies Initiative. So you can go in and take, and this is what MRM also does. You you really have a you know you have a core training in all things and all in natural sciences and social science um, and writing. Writing is so important. What an important skill, no matter what. Writing is very important. Um, and economics and coastal policy. So uh, I, I, my degree is kind of this like patchwork of all those things. I have no training in film, however. Um, my only, I, I'm totally self-taught and I, I really encourage people if they are interested in film to just go out and shoot and start editing things. Um, it's it's not that hard if you have a passion for it. And and we're really used to it. You know, your generation, high schoolers now, um, you guys are documenting your lives without even really knowing it <laughs> um, on social media. And um, that's something that I didn't have growing up at all. And so I think one of the best pieces of advice I got when I before I filmed my, my Greenland documentary was um, it doesn't matter what camera you have. It matters how you tell the story. You could tell the whole story on a GoPro or just a really crappy camcorder. Um, as long as the story is good, the imagery will just 
follow. And also the imagery in Greenland, it's hard to get a bad shot, honestly. But um, yeah, I would encourage more maybe science and writing um, and other skills. And then the film is just really about practical experience of filmmaking. Fantastic, Saskia. You are an inspiration. You make me want to go and take some film on my iPhone and see what I can do in iMovie, right? Yeah. So thank you so much for your presentation, giving us an insight and what it's like to combine your passions for science and your passions for film. Um, so we thank you so much for your time and thank you for your presentation.